Okay. This my uh, presentation on this computer from one projector to another is really messed up. Every day it changes. So what's here is different from what here, but hopefully you can get this to work. All right. Let's start with recap before we move on with where we were. Um, but before uh, we do that, I just want to remind you, if you have your extra credit, please turn it in before you leave here. And lab reports, if you have it, turn it in here. If not, before uh, the Monday lab, before you leave by 5 p.m., please under my, my door, my office door. Okay. So let's do some recap. Can you, can anyone define chromatography? Yes, Ben. Without reading from your screen. It was very close, yeah. <laughs> so basically, it's a separation technique utilizing two phases. One would be stationary and what would be uh, a mobile phase. And you might have a mixture. You, you would use chromatography to separate different solutes within a mixture. And that could be for purification purposes, uh, for uh, identifications of unknown within your sample, for particular quantification of a certain component, you isolate it from the others and convert absorbance or area under the curve to uh, concentration. What's the difference between stationary phase and mobile phase, and what's the function of each, Ray? Okay, so you've got it about 80% correct. So yes, yeah, stationary phase is a, a station phase where it doesn't move, and mobile phase is the carrier solvent, the solvent that carries the solute with. But first of all, before you separate, you need the solute to interact with your stationary phase. If your solute does not interact with your stationary phase, there will be no separation. It will just leave without, uh, separate, without you being able to see it on your chromatogram. So first, you have to have an interaction between a solute and stationary phase. And then the mobile phase comes in and tries to remove that solute from stationary phase and carry it with it. Sometimes you have to add something to your mobile phase to help with eluting or removing your solute from the column or from the stationary phase to help it come out. And we'll talk about this later today when we say isocratic elution versus gradient elution. That means with a gradient, you're changing the concentration of your mobile phase over time to help removing whatever has been interacting with your stationary phase. Three types of chromatography. Nora. Very good. So we have gas chromatography, liquid chromatography, and supercritical chromatography. What is the form of the mobile phase in GC, and what is the form of the stationary phase in GC? I will go with Sven. Uh, mm -hmm. Liquid. Very good. So now a same question for partition. What's the mobile phase in? Yes, Nicole. They're both liquid. What, did, what about adsorption? Yes, Agnes? Huh? I can't hear you. What's the mobile phase? Liquid. And then, so, and then the stationary phase? Solid, yes, yes. I didn't hear correctly, yes. Uh, what is partition coefficient? How is it defined? Yes, Jesse. 
yes, how fast the, it can elute with the mole, but what's the ratio? You said correctly, it's a ratio of something to something. <coughs> what determined the partition? Something is partitioning between your stationary phase and your mobile phase. So the concentration in your first phase to the concentration of the second phase is the partition coefficient. So at equilibrium, you will, you will have a partition coefficient that is constant. Okay, so these are some of the facts we covered last time, so we can move on. <clears throat> I just want to introduce supercritical fluid chromatography briefly. It's not going to be the focus uh, of chromatography lectures or applications, but if you hear that term, I would like you to know what it is. So I will briefly introduce it. So as the um, name implies, it's supercritical fluid because the mobile phase you use is at a higher than ambient pressure and temperature. So if you are using CO2, which is under ambient conditions, it's gas. When you increase the pressure, temperature it becomes a liquid. Okay? So that's why it's super critical <coughs> fluid because CO2 is becoming under certain conditions liquid. So it's a very hydrophobic phase, okay? So it will be used to separate hydrophobic component, but if you add methanol to it, you enhance inter, uh, separation of a little bit more, relatively more polar compounds. So adding methanol to a liquid CO2 will help in separation slightly more polar compounds and less polar uh, compounds. So usually this CO2 has low density and it's therefore and it's low viscosity so you have higher diffusive I'm not going to say this word higher this. <laughs> okay so when, when you have higher this uh, this means you have a better um, movement of the so solute between the mobile phase and the stationary phase. So you reach equilibrium faster and you get better resolution. We'll talk about resolution more towards the end of the chromatography um, part and probably Friday we'll get to that. And then you will know what I mean when you reach equilibrium faster, why is that leads to better separation. Resolution is in general terms separation of two compounds from each other. So they resolve from each other. So we call it resolution, they separate. Okay, and then since you reach um, equilibrium faster, the analysis time is faster too. So it really uh, is very helpful in that manner. It enhances the resolution and reduce analysis time. And since you can combine liquid CO2 with methanol, it gives you a broader range for what you can separate, broader than when you're using just HPLC, regular liquid chromatography, or when you're using regular GC. With supercritical fluid, it gives you a broader range of what you can separate. Um, so it's mostly for relatively nonpolar molecules, but with addition of methanol, you can separate slightly more polar. And if you cannot use GC because you're, use, you're dealing with compounds that are non-volatile and non-thermally stable, then this would add an advantage. With GC, when, you, when Gary covers the GC, you'll see that oftentimes you need to derivatize. That means you need to change the characteristic of a particular compound to make it more heat stable or more volatile. By doing so, then you can use GC. So it's an additional step in the analysis. And we'll do, you're actually going to do that when you do the fatty acid determination in um, the GC lab. So GC often requires derivatization, but when you use supercritical fluid chromatography, you might eliminate this step. Um, the stationary phase, what you use 
as a stationary phase in supercritical fluid chromatography is similar to what we would use in high performance liquid chromatography. And when we cover this, we have two lectures on that. We'll talk about the different phases that can be used. And the equipment that is associated or used for supercritical fluid is, are similar to those used for GC. So similar detectors, for example, flame ionization detector is a common one for GC and can also be used for, um, for the supercritical fluid chromatography. So this is all what you need to know about this type of chromatography. So now I want to move on and expand on liquid chromatography, which is the main um, chromatography type that I'm going to be talking about from now till until next Wednesday. To cover basic chromatography, then move into HPLC, and then after that, Gary will take over for GC. So in liquid chromatography, you have mainly two types. You have the planar chromatography, and you have the column uh, liquid chromatography. With planar chromatography, there you have also two types. You have paper chromatography and you have thin layer chromatography. Paper chromatography is the most primitive form of planar chromatography. And you might have seen it in one of your labs, chemistry labs. You might have used paper chromatography. Most common labs that use paper chromatography, I've even had it when I was a student in organic chem lab. We did um, separation of amino acids and sprayed with ninhydrin to visualize them. So basically, you have a paper which is made up of cellulose, and it would be your support. It's not your stationary phase, it's just the support. And you impregnate it with a liquid phase, which is your water. Then your water becomes your stationary phase. It's like you're wetting the paper with water. So you have a basically a wet paper. And the water on the paper would be your stationary phase. And then um, what you would do, we used to draw a line with pencil, and then we spot our samples, standards versus individual samples. And we usually keep a distance. So probably one inch here, and then between each sample, another inch. <clears throat> and then you have a um, resolving chamber that you would use. In that chamber, <coughs> you have a clamp where you clamp the paper. And at the bottom here, you have your mobile phase. And usually your mobile phase is immiscible with your initial stationary phase. So if you have water as a stationary phase, your solvent here could be heptane, hexane, um, pentane, so uh, acetone. So it's stuff that are uh, immiscible or chloroform, immiscible with, wa with water. OK, so what happens, and then the humidity in that chamber is controlled, or you close it so that you don't have, you have a controlled kind of humidity in the chamber. And then what happens over time, your solvent will start ascending, moving up your paper to, in your paper. And with it, the components of your sample start moving up again with your mobile phase. And the way they move, it depends on their liking of that mobile phase. The more they like the mobile phase, the more they're going to go up with it. If they dislike that mobile phase, it's going to stay put associating with the water, okay, or move slower. So basically, they start separating based on their degree of, or partition coefficient, basically. So how much they like the water versus how much they like the organic solvent. Obviously, when you have uh, when you're separating components that are not uh, do not have a visible color, like amino acids, for example, that you cannot see them as they separate, then you need to have a step where you can actually visually see your uh, components. So, for example, you spray with ninhydrin. Ninhydrin is a compound that will interact with amino acid, and depending on the type of amino acid, you get different colors. So you will see them 
spot it on your paper. So you spray and then you let it dry and then you'll see the color develop over time. And sometimes um, you need something different to visualize. Like in this example, you're looking at sugars, glucose and sucrose. So you use autoradiography to uh, visualize it. There are other means of visualization I'll talk about later when I talk about thin layer chromatography. You can do 2D uh, uh, paper chromatography. You can do that whether it's paper or thin layer chromatography. In two dimension, what happens is you do the same as I said earlier. You have your paper impregnated with water and then you have your solvent and you have your first separation. You can see that are some not very separated from, another, from the other. So what you can do is you turn the paper 90 degrees and then you immerse it again in a different chamber with a different solvent that has different polarity basically, or slightly different polarity, and you're changing the partition coefficient of your individual solutes by choosing a different solvent. And this way, you'll get better separation. Then you'll see those that were close together, they separate on a second dimension. <clears throat> and this is a qualitative mostly technique, so it's just visualization to see what you have in your sample and the relative abundancy. So it's not really a, a quantitative measure. Although it's not a quantitative measure, you can get something called relative mobility. This RF here is a relative mobility, and it distinguishes the different solutes within your sample. So relative mobility is the distance moved by the component to the distance moved by the solvent. So usually you have a solvent front, we call it. So you'll see that at the end of uh, your, the time that you, uh, you use to resolve this, you'll see that the solvent front reaches a certain edge of the paper. So you measure from the start line to where you see an edge, which is not visible here in this example, but normally you would see an edge where the solvent reached. And then you measure the distance from the starting line to the center of, of the circle where you have a color developed. And that gives you the distance for the component over distance moved by the solvent. That gives you an idea of the relative polarity of the, um, if you're doing reverse phase or normal phase, this will give you a relative polarity or relative um, partition coefficient between the different solutes within your sample. Now, this is again a primitive technique, and to get this uh, R value here, it depends on many different factors. So it might change if you have a different stationary phase, obviously. It might change with the thickness of your paper, because the thickness of the paper dictate how fast the, the solvent is going to move. And then also the humidity within the chamber how long you have the distance, how long is the paper, and also the temperature um, of where you have that chamber because also temperature helps with the movement. Higher temperature usually aids in quicker movement. So in order to compare, you need to run everything under similar conditions. Yes. So yeah, what Cindy is trying to say is the mobile phase sometimes is not only constituent of one component. You might have propanol and chloroform or something in there in different ratio. Yeah. So also the, the composition of your mobile phase will affect that. Okay. <clears throat> so the paper chromatography can be reversed phase. So when, when you have cellulose and you have water as your stationary phase, it's a normal phase. Because when you have a polar stationary phase, 
and then you have, please do not use your cell phone while in your lecture, please. If you need to use your phone, you can step outside. I don't mind if you have to leave, that's okay. Um, okay, so what I was saying is when you have water as your stationary phase, then, and your, your organic solvent is obviously nonpolar, then this is normal phase. You can swap that. You can actually impregnate with a nonpolar solvent and develop with water, then becomes a reverse phase. Um, chromatography. You can also have a stationary phase that is ion exchange. So the cellulose, they ha have OH groups. So the OH groups can be derivatized into an acid with an acid group or a base group. So they can carry a charge. If they are derivatized with an acid group, they will carry a negative charge. If they are derivatized with a base group, they will carry a positive charge. Then you will separate you will have an ion exchange, meaning ions will be exchanged between the stationary phase and the mobile phase, and then you will have an ion exchange chromatography, but paper. We'll talk more about ion exchange in more detail later on. Okay, so in reverse phase paper chromatography, where you have impregnated with an organic uh, so solvent and you are um, resolving with water. Which one of these? Are correct. Yeah, Ray? I would say A. You would say A. Any other question? Um, question answers. Uh, Amanda? Amanda says A and C, which is D. So that would be correct. So Ray was 50% correct, and Amanda is 100% correct. Okay, so when you have reverse phase, your, mo your mobile phase is more polar. So your your polar components are going to travel the most. They're traveling with the water. So they're going to travel the furthest. And because they're traveling the furthest, their RF value will be the highest because it's the distance the compound travel over the distance the solvent travel. So the more they travel, the higher is the RF value, so A and C. Okay, TLC. What is another acronym for TLC? Huh? What? Oh. The learning channel. That's a third one. <laughs> <laughs> What's another one? Okay. Yes, okay. I'll tell you this story that I always share. I, I find it funny. I laugh at myself every time I remember this. I was giving chromatography lecture, and by the time I was done, I need to go get my daughter from a daycare. So I stopped there, and she was sitting in one of the teacher's lap. What's going on? So your daughter needed TLC today. I was like, thin layer chromatography? <laughs> <laughs> no, tender love and care. Ah, OK, I learned a new thing. So OK, <clears throat> so thin layer chromatography is similar principle as paper chromatography, but it has better resolution. Why it has better, have you ever used thin layer chromatography before? Okay, the, um, in olden times, when I was a student more than several years ago, um, we used to plate our own thin layer chromatography. So we get glass and we have to wash it really well and then clean it with alcohol and then prepare our own silica solution. And then we use kind of something similar to what you used to paint the wall and then just and then have a very thin layer and then let it dry and then do our experiment. But now you can buy them and you can actually buy them on glass or on aluminum. Um, what other substrate? Glass or aluminum? Okay. So, so the, the reason it's better resolution because you can spread a really thin layer of silica so if you use silica with very small particle size powder, then you can have a really small particle size thin layer evenly distributed if you do it correctly. And with that, you will learn later when we cover resolution, the smaller the particle size, the better is the resolution and that is the better is the separation. So you have a much better resolution of thin layer chromatography than when you have paper chromatography. And it is faster because when you have a thin layer, your mobile phase moves faster, obviously, so you get the fa faster analysis time. 
And you have better reproducibility, meaning if you run it multiple times on different days or different times per day, you'll get similar results, better than paper. Because with paper, you have more heterogeneity than having uh, thin layer chromatography. Okay, so yes, the third one would be plastic, but the more common support is glass and aluminum. <coughs> so that would be your inert support. That means they don't interact with anything. And then you have your sorbent, and the sorbent is usually silica, alumina, or cellulose. All of these are known to be, they have hydroxyl groups, so they're more like a polar phase. So it can be applied as adsorptive, meaning you don't have to impregnate it with any liquid. So it would be solid. Your stationary phase is silica or alumina or cellulose, so solid phase. And then you'll have your mobile phase as liquid. So that's why it would be adsorptive. Or you can impregnate it with water, so it'd be normal phase, or impregnate it with organic solvent. It would be um, reversed phase, but in this case, normal or reverse would be partition. Or again, you can have ion exchange, the same, the OAH groups of silica, alumina, or cellulose can be derivatized with acid or base um, components. So how to visualize? So again, with paper, same as paper, if you're doing amino acids using TLC, for example, you can spray with an anhydrin. Other way of developing is with sulfuric acid. You spray with a strong acid, so it will burn your compounds will turn uh, brown, brown to black, then you can visually see them. And this is common, for example, for fat separation. You do that in experimental light. Yeah, yeah, lipid, different lipid classes, yeah. You can spray with acid that way. Another, this is destructive. Ninhydrin is destructive, sulfuric acid is destructive. Iodine vapor is also used, and it's non-destructive. It will um, non-permanently give you a color that will fade once it interacts with the different components. Um, you can also measure uh, absorption of radiation or emission. If it's an emission, it's fluorescence. <clears throat> or if you can have a radioactively labeled, radioactive labeled compounds, you can measure radioactivity that way. It is a qualitative, but in some cases can be semi-quantitative and to a certain extent quantitative. But what you can do is a semi-quantitative is when you measure density. So there are ways that you can measure, you can put an image and there are programs that will take that image and based on how intense is the color, you can determine the density of each spot and with that get a relative concentration. So that's a semi-quantitative. If you want it to be more, yes? So you measure that how can you use the density? If you want to get a, not a relative concentration, sometimes you want just a relative concentration, like what we do in GC lab, it's going to be a relative concentration. Sometimes you get the density of all the spots, and then you would say out of all of these spots, you get a percentage. This represents 20% of the total. Or this represents 50% of the total. You could. I'm saying if you don't have a standard curve, then you do it that way. If you have a standard curve, then you would have to run on the same TLC plate five, at least five different concentration with your sample. Then you can have, you plot them. You plot the density against concentration. You have a standard curve and then you determine the concentration of the unknown. But that is a limiting, because then you cannot run a lot on one plate, and every time you have to run all the standards on the same plate to do that. It gets to be tedious, but it's doable. Another way to get quantitative measurement, and this is not a relative, it's actually quantitative, if you scrape it off, elute it using a, a particular column, and then use an assay might be an enzymatic assay to determine concentration, for example. Okay, any questions on planar chromatography? <coughs> All right, column liquid chromatography, which is the most common liquid chromatography. It's more quantitative, 
And in some cases, it's preparative. So you do it just to prepare or isolate a fraction for further analysis. So there are actually two types of column liquid chromatography. You have the low pressure column liquid chromatography, and then you have the high pressure or high performance liquid chromatography, which we'll talk about next week. So this is a low pressure system. And low pressure columns look like this, okay? So this is an empty column, and you usually get the column, they're very expensive, and they have several different parts and attachment to it to allow you to attach the column to the pump, for example, the column to the detector, or column to another, uh, to a fraction collector. So it comes with parts associated, and then the compartments open, so you can open this and then fill it with your stationary phase. So and they come in different sizes. So there's here, there is some, some sort of stationary phase in there. And um, so you can have taller, smaller, wider, a little wider. They can come this wide. They can be this short and this wide. They can be as tall as me. So there are all sorts of dimensions of the column. And the size of the column dictates how much sample you can separate. So the larger the column, the more you can inject, the larger sample you can inject. The taller is the column, the better separation or resolution you're going to get, okay? So size, total size versus length determines uh, different things you can do. How much you can separate, how well you can separate, and usually filling the column is an art. And it takes a lot of practice to do that. And I don't know if any of you ladies have filled the column before. <laughs> if Matt is here, he would tell you how hard it is to fill a column. It takes sometimes few hours to get the column well fitted and with the right pressure and the light, right length. Sometimes you have to fill and then empty and fill again. It, it's really an art, but you have instructions and you would do it. It will probably work from the 10th time. I mean, the first time doesn't work, but sometimes not that bad. But anyway, you, you form a slurry usually with your media. Media is your stationary phase. So you have whatever media it is, you form, you form a slurry with it, and then you gradually, using a, a pump, you put it in, and then using the pump, you apply pressure, and you let it settle to a certain length. And usually there's instruction, how, what would be the length that you want to pour it to, based on how much media you have. Anyway, but this is beyond this class, but anyway, you, you filled your column. <clears throat> and you have your column and you have your media filled and ready. So what are the different compartments? Sometimes you have one mobile phase, and if you have a one mobile phase that doesn't change over time, this is called isocratic elution. Okay, so you would have one solution, let's say it's water, or it's a salty water, or it's a buffer. So you will have one pump attached to it that helps you with delivering a particular rate, flow rate. With flow rate meaning how many mils per minute a pump can pump. Okay. <clears throat> when you have two different solvents, and sometimes it's three and sometimes it's actually four, you're changing the concentration of your mobile phase over time. This is gradient mobile phase, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So when the mobile phase concentration does not change, this is isocratic, when the concentration changes, it is gradient. Just leave it at that for now. <clears throat> and then what happens is you have to run mobile phase through the column to make sure your column is activated and ready for your run. And then there is a place where an injection port, which is not shown here, but it's a place where you can insert or inject a sample at the top of your column. So usually there is an injection port somewhere here, and then the solvent goes through the injection port and carries the sample onto your column. 
Then the sample is on your column. <coughs> and then the mobile phase is going to carry it through the column. And then it's going to interact with your stationary phase. And the, the mobile phase is going to move it gradually down, down, down through the column. Now you have two choices. Either it goes to a detector and then ends there. You get a reading. You get a chromatograph. Or if you're interested to collect each component individually, either you're, you're purifying something or you want to collect it to further quantify it, you can have a fraction collector. And usually it's a carousel that turns based on how you want it, how you time it. Sometimes you say, okay, stop every five minutes. So it will collect three ml or five ml every five minutes. If your rate is one milliliter per minute, for example, every five minutes you collect five ml. And so on. So it, usually the carousel is timed. You can time it based on what comes out of your column. Other times, your sample goes to a different route. So if you open the valve here, you direct it somewhere different, and you already have an assay set. So if you're separating an enzyme, for example, and you want to determine enzyme activity, it can go to another uh, place where you combine your enzyme with a substrate. You get a color. You have another detector here, like spectrophotometer detector. You get an absorbance. And from there, you plot enzyme activity. So you can do so many things with, uh, with that, depending on the objective of your method. <clears throat> so let me go back to isocratic versus gradient. Oftentimes, you're going to hear me say, increase the mobile phase strength. Okay, are you familiar with this? Do you know what that means? Increase the strength of the mobile phase over time. OK, so let's say I'm going to give you an example. And we'll talk about that a little bit more also when we cover HPLC. <clears throat> let's say our mobile phase is, I'm going to give you an example that we use for hydrophobic interaction chromatography. So you have a column, OK? And then you have a protein solution. And the media here, the column, the, the media that is in the column is hydrophobic. So in order for the proteins to interact with your column, what's going to happen is you need to salt them out. You need to run it with, with high concentration of salt. That means you are neutralizing the charges on the protein, so they will precipitate on your column. And each will precipitate at a different rate. And uh, like some will precipitate right away. Some will need higher salt concentration to precipitate and so on. But that's not the point. Let's say that the protein is now traveling down the column, but it's taking a long time. So if we have. So if I want to plot, usually we monitor at 280, the protein, 280 nanometer. They absorb at 280. And this is over time. So if I could only elute with salt solution, okay? So the salt solution is going to just keep, keep the protein on the column. And it's just going to move by diffusion, really. And it's not going to move because it's liking the salt solution. It's precipitating. So it's just moving by diffusion through the column. So it might take a really long time to come out, probably six hours. So I want to increase the strength of the mobile phase. And then I will introduce, after a certain point, I would reduce salt concentration. And then another time, just do water. So I'm going from high salt to low salt to water. Then my protein might come out after 45 minutes of NLs. So I reduced my analysis time. 
But without having a salt solution, my protein will not interact. If I just start with water at the beginning, really, it will just come out with the void volume. It will come out here with your void volume, will not be detected. We won't see separation. But since different proteins have different charges, you can separate proteins by changing the salt concentration, by lowering it. Some will move faster than others, and then you will have several peaks rather than just one huge peak that comes out after six hours. Okay, so basically, in this case, I increased the strength of the mobile phase. So it's a gradient elution. In other cases, let's say you have reversed phase chromatography. That's another example. I'm going to give you different examples because increasing the strength of the mobile phase does not always mean in one direction. Okay. It depends on what you're, you're analyzing. So if we have reverse phase chromatography, so you have here um, C18 column. It's, it's just a hydrophobic column. Take it, take it like that. And then you have, let's say, 10% um, acetonitrile, 90% water. That's your mobile phase. OK, so is it more polar or less polar? Is it a polar or nonpolar solvent? Polar, you have more water. So you have 90% water, 10% acetonitrile. So you're, you're separating, let's say, uh, phytochemicals. So they're going to go in the column. And then as they go in, they're going to separate based on their affinity to the column. Okay, But this one up here is the most hydrophobic. So let's say we have here again, let's say this is 254 for a particular phytochemical, and then here's your time. So these ones will come out at a decent time. And then the last one, it will take an hour and a half to get it out, while these took 15 and 20 minutes. So you're just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. How would you increase the strength of the mobile phase in this case? Jenny? Um, increase concentration of acetonitrile. Increase the concentration of acetonitrile. So make that 30%, make that 70% water. So now you're giving this compound more hydrophobicity, so it will like to interact with it more. So it will gradually start moving faster. So the, co the distribution coefficient will be higher in this case. It will start liking the mobile phase, going in and out faster, and leaving. It will probably come out here. So in this case, increasing the strength of the column is by increasing the organic solvent. In case of normal phase, it will be the opposite. This is going to be water. This is going to be acetonitrile. So in this case, increasing the strength will be adding water, increasing the concentration of water. So increasing the strength of the mobile phase, so the message that you need to take out, take from this is it doesn't matter which direction. It depends on what you want to achieve. Okay? If, you, if you have a hydrophilic component here, you just want to put more water, hydrophobic component, more organic solvent, um, reduce the salt. You'll see in other um, type of chromatography, change the pH or sometimes increase the salt. So increasing the strength of the mobile phase is whatever you need to do to help removing the solute from the stationary phase and reduce the retention time. 
That's what increasing the strength is. You're, you're doing whatever you need to do to reduce the analysis time. Okay, there are other ways like increasing the temperature, but usually when you have um, high, low pressure liquid chromatography, you cannot change as much as you can when you have high pressure liquid chromatography. With high pressure, columns are smaller. You, can, you have uh, ovens specifically for the columns, so increasing the temperature helps with the resolution, reduces the time of separation. But with, with liquid chromatography that is low pressure, when you have large volumes, usually the best way to do it is to go with mobile phase changes. That's a good question, though. Okay. <clears throat> so we talked about briefly about the different modes of separation. But now we're going to go in, into more detail for each one of them. And this is a figure you have in your book. And it illustrates the different modes of separation. We talked about types of chromatography. Now I want to elaborate on modes of separation. OK. Each mode of separation involves a different physical chemical characteristic. It has to do with interactions of the solute and the stationary phase. All right. So adsorptive chromatography, you have a solid phase, and the solute adsorb to the solid phase. And that's how they get retained and delayed, based on the, how well they interact with that solid phase. The partition chromatography, you have an inert support and you have a layer of a liquid. And then in this case, the solute is partitioning between the liquid on the inner support and the liquid that is your mobile phase. Ion exchange chromatography, you have a solid phase, but that solid phase have functional groups. So these functional groups carry charge, either positive or negative charge. And you can therefore separate charged molecules that will interact with your charged stationary phase. Affinity chromatography, you have a very specific interaction between your solute and your stationary phase. It's like um, antibody and antigen interaction, enzyme and a substrate interaction, or an enzyme inhibitor interaction. So it's a very specific, like lock and key kind of interaction. Therefore, you can select very specific solutes that would interact, and everything else that is different will not interact. <clears throat> Molecular exclusion or size exclusion or gel permeation, they all mean the same thing, <coughs> which is based on separation of different sizes of molecules. They could be a molecular weight and a morphology or a shape difference. So it separates based on the molecular structure, size, and form. There's no interactions, no chemical, physical chemical interactions. There is only physical, actually, because it goes into the pores based on its size and get delayed that way. So we're going to talk about each one of these separately next time. Okay. I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>